It's October 13, 1972, a Friday. Friends from Montevideo, Uruguay, Argentina, who plays rugby for the same team are traveling to Chile for a match, including 40 passengers and 5 workers. In addition to crew companions, friends, family, and others were also on board, having been recruited to support paying the expense of the plane, as it is expensive to fly commercially to Chile, so they chose the least expensive solution. They had to spend the night in Mendoza, Argentina, due to bad weather in the highlands and left the next day at around 2.18 p.m. The Fairchild was only designed to fly as high as about 22,500 feet. Therefore the pilots planned a course south to the Pass of Plankin, where the aircraft could safely clear the Andes, even though Santiago was to the west of Mendoza. One of the rugby player Fernando Parado sat down with his best friend, Panchito, asked him to change seats so he could be at the window and see the view. Fernando Parado is unaware that this humble action will finally save his life. The pilot radioed air traffic controllers about an hour after departure to know he was flying very closely over the mountains. A little while later, he claimed that he had reached Curico, Chile, which is about 110 miles, 178 kilometers, south of Santiago, and had turned north. The plane was still in the Andes, but the pilot had completely misjudged its location. They were unable to see much because of the clouds, and they estimated their distance as being one minute when it was actually 11 minutes. Controllers offers him the go-ahead to start lowering in preparation of a landing before they realize their error. The Chilean control tower was unable to reach the aircraft shortly after that. On October 13 at around 3.30 p.m., the plane collided with a mountain, losing first its left and then its right wing before landing in a secluded valley in Argentina not far from the Chilean border. Just then, the aircraft crashes against a mountain. What occurs next, unfortunately, is even more surprising. At 11,710 feet, above sea level, the plane came to a stop. There are glaciers all around them. Some of them are screaming while having pieces of the plane lodged in their mangled limbs. Many of the passengers have managed to survive. Some of them are screaming. Initially, 12 persons were killed in the crash, leaving 33 survivors, some of whom suffered injuries. At a height of about 11,500 feet, the group had to struggle with snow and super cold conditions. The body of the aircraft was mostly unbroken but offered little protection from the weather. A search for the crashed plane was launched, but it was soon discovered that the last reported location was incorrect. Rescue operations were moved to the Andes, and later, the survivors saw many planes. Insanely cold conditions remain on the first night, with lows of minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. The survivors gather into the aircraft and use baggage to try to cover the gaps. They all mistakenly believe that they will be rescued by a rescue team and that this will be their final night on the mountainside. They are completely mistaken. However, it was challenging to find the white plane because of the snow-covered mountains. Also, many people thought there were no survivors because of the extreme environmental conditions. On the first night, five more victims pass away from their injuries. The co-pilot, who made the fatal mistake, is alive but crushed under material and the pilot is dead. He pleads that the survivor shoot him with his gun to end his suffering. He wasn't killed, but he passes away shortly after. They melt the snow and funnel it into empty wine bottles. The limited food supplies, which mostly consisted of candy bars and wine, were also depleted in roughly a week. One morning, Parado found himself cradling a single chocolate-covered peanut, on the first day. He slowly sucked the chocolate off the peanut, on the second day, he sucked gently on the peanut for hours, allowing himself only a tiny nibble now and then. He did the same on the third day, and when he finally nibbled the peanut down to nothing, there was no food left at all. They were concerned that they were hungry, cold, and alone. On a transistor radio, they had reported inside the wreckage, they suddenly heard that the search for them had been suspended. The search was stopped after eight days. Suddenly, they received a shocking statement from a survivor, I'm going to eat the dead pilot. After a lengthy debate, the hungry survivors decided to eat dead bodies. Over the next few days, six others died. Then, on October 29th, a storm partially covered the aircraft with snow, burying it, and resulting in eight more deaths. 
Those who were able to start tending to the more seriously injured did so right away. They built a shelter in the broken aircraft by piling together plane seats and sheltering their day and night. They heated the snow and provided a steady stream of drinking water using the aluminum from the seat backs. However, their rations were insufficient. It was just a matter of time before their bodies consumed themselves entirely in the high altitude of the Andes. They just had one option. Some of the survivors cut tiny slices from one of the body's buttocks with the help of a glass shard, as they ate in silence. Some dragged off taking that crucial step as long as they could in the vain hope of being saved. Then, though, they discovered a transistor radio, and a small group of people listened closely as a Chilean news broadcast proclaimed the end of official search efforts even from the Andes. One of them shouted to the rest of the survivors, Hey boys, there's good news. They've called off the search. One shouted back, why the hell is it good news? Because it means we're going to get out of here on our own, increasing the remaining survivors' belief that they must now set out across the mountains in search of civilization and assistance. It seemed an impossible task, they weren't any mountain climbers, they were all extremely weak and without any proper clothing or equipment. However, there was no other way. They built a sledge, put together the stuff for a sleeping bag, and chose the march. After weeks of preparation and failed attempts, the group, originally three, but later reduced to two to conserve resources, left to the west in search of Chile. They managed to climb the nearest peak, all 15,000 feet of it, despite the bitter cold and debilitating altitude sickness. High mountains and a valley that ran through them were all they could see. Roberto Canessa, one of the climbers, said to Prado, the other, we have suffered through so much. Now, let's go die together. They stumbled along the glacier below after attempting to force themselves to move forward but becoming weaker day by day until, on December 18th, they heard rushing water. They made their way down the other side of the mountain in a desperate and unsure manner. They started to follow the river, which had its source there. A rusting soup can, a horseshoe, cow excrement, a herd of cows, and eventually, on the evening of December 20th, a guy riding a horse across the river were the only indications of mankind they saw the following day. The next day, when they were met by three more, Parado attempted to introduce himself by imitating a plane crashing but was unable to be heard over the roar of the river. He was scared the men would leave since they would think he was crazy as he was doing it. The solution was for one of the guys to attach a message on a rock and throw it over the river with the words, Tell me what you want. Parado started writing while his hands were trembling, saying, I come from a plane that fell into the mountains. He indicated that he and Canessa were weak and starving, that there were still 14 companions on the plane, and that they urgently required help. When are you going to come fetch us? He stopped just before throwing the rock back. Even so, was he powerful enough? With all of his remaining effort, he threw the stone into the river, where it bounced and then rolled onto the bank. He then watched as it did so. After reading it, the man indicated with his hands that he understood. Dot on their side of the river, later that morning, another man riding a horse appeared, and they quickly found themselves inside a hut receiving hot food. Along with a group of reporters, the mounted police from Chile arrived. Rescue helicopters landed, and although though it was obvious that their crews did not believe Parado's tale of climbing and descending the mountain, they followed him on his hunt for the plane. Parado was removed of his multiple layers of dirty clothing and given a warm shower at a hospital in San Fernando, Chile. He saw himself in a mirror while he was drying off with a towel. He was but skin and bones, a poor imitation of the fit young guy who had stepped onto the plane two and a half months earlier. But he kept repeating two phrases to himself with each breath he drew. I am life. I'm still here. I am life.